begin. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first hearing of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission in the 160th, 116th Congress on Human Rights, Corruption, and Accountability in El Salvador. Um, we are still awaiting the appointment of the Commission's new Republican co-chair, uh, but the human rights uh, problems around the world are such that we wanted to go ahead and get the ball rolling. Um, I would like to extend a special welcome to our witnesses, all of whom have traveled to be with us today from El Salvador, San Francisco by way of Boston, and the Eastern Shore. Uh, we deeply appreciate the work that you do, and we thank you for your presence. Uh, I think we're gonna, can we just shut that door? Yeah, because I... It has been more than 25 years since El Salvador's internal armed conflict ended. And I remember when the 1992 peace accords went into effect and it was a moment of celebration and optimism. The war had been so brutal and, and so devastating. More than 70,000, maybe 80,000 people were killed. Catholic nuns, priests among them, union activists, student activists, campesino leaders. Yet peace was finally at hand, except that it wasn't. Uh, as you will hear today, violence in El Salvador is unrelenting. Since the Civil War ended, El Salvador's homicide rate has consistently ranked among the top three in the world, excluding countries engaged in armed conflict. And in 2015, it exceeded for the first time the number of annual homicides during the period of the Civil War. In recent years, those homicides have included targeted killings of, of security forces by gangs, uh, extrajudicial killings of gang suspects by police, and among the world's highest rates of femicides, killing women and girls. In addition to the more than 3,300 homicides committed in 2018, more than 3,000 people were reported as disappeared. Many of the disappeared are never found, but are suspected dead. What is going on? Observers identify a combination of factors that interact and are mutually reinforcing. Economic vulnerability, the unintended consequences of anti-drug and anti-gang po gang policies, institutions weakened by pervasive and entrenched impunity and corruption. In the end, social justice has been elusive. Instead, the, the human rights of, of Salvadorans are violated every day in every conceivable way. No one should be surprised that people flee the country seeking escape. In fact, some 1.4 million Salvadoran immigrants, one-fifth of the country's current population, live in the United States, of whom nearly half a million are unauthorized and another nearly 200,000 are beneficiaries of temporary protected status, TPS. In 2017, those 1.4 million immigrants sent home $5 billion in remittances, 18% of El Salvador's gross domestic product. El Salvador's growth rate is already the second lowest in Central America. Were half of those immigrants suddenly deported to El Salvador, the economic in impact would be devastating. So where does all this leave us? U.S. policymakers have taken steps to respond to the human rights crisis in El Salvador. Our diplomats have emphasized the importance of addressing issues such as corruption, impunity, and human rights. Congress has appropriated more than $2.6 billion over four years to fund the U.S. strategy for engagement in Central America to promote economic prosperity, strengthen governance, and improve security in the region, including at least $342 million for El Salvador, subject to conditions that require the Salvadoran government to take steps to address corruption and human rights abuses. The State Department has worked with the Department of Justice to help fight financial crimes, extortion, and corruption, protect witnesses, and strengthen prosecutorial capacity. The U.S. helped the Attorney General establish a gender unit that works on cases of femicides, domestic violence, and crimes against the LBGTI uh, community. Um, the Human Rights Violators and a War Crimes Unit in, in Immigration and Customs Enforcement has investigated past human rights violations in El Salvador. But for, re for many reasons, it's, it's not enough. It's not enough because we are, uh, because as we are about to hear, the terrible human rights situation persists. Because as a new president prepares to take office, we're seeing risks of backsliding, such as the Legislative Assembly's decision not to renew the mandate of former Attorney General Douglas Melendez. Because the U current U.S. administration has sent mixed signals about its support for creating a SIG-like 
body in El Salvador to fight corruption, and because the U.S. has a moral responsibility to do more. You know, we armed and we trained and we equipped the Salvadoran Armed Forces uh, during the war, uh, including the infamous Atlacat Battalion, uh, which was responsible for the murders of innocent women and children in El Mazote and also the murders of six Jesuit priests, their housekeeper and their daughter in 1989 at the University of Central America. Uh, University of Central America. We trained people who were responsible for some of the most notorious human rights crimes committed during the Civil War. Uh, we deported Salvadoran youths involved in gang activity in the U.S. without regard for the consequences uh, in El Salvador. MS-13 was not born in El Salvador. It was born in the United States of America. We exported that to El Salvador. We have supported hardline, militarized, anti-drug and anti-gang policies that failed to stop and instead exacerbated the, spir the spiral of violence in the country. And now the current administration seeks to deny the right to asylum for those fleeing the violence in El Salvador, including women and children. So we must do more. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing the recommendations from our witnesses today. And again, I, I, I thank you for being here. Uh, before I introduce our witnesses, I want to enter into the record statements and materials submitted by the Latin America Working Group uh, Educational Fund, the Washington Office on Latin America, uh, Oxfam America, Professor Ho Jose Miguel Cruz of Florida International University. Uh, and so let me begin by introducing our w witnesses. Um, uh, 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 Christian Schlick Saldia, who is an a, uh, attorney and human rights activist, originally from Chile, who currently works as a legal consultant with the Justice uh, Processes Team at the Human Rights Institute of the Jesuit University of Central America in El Salvador. Uh, Noah Bullock is the executive director of Christosol, which works to advance human rights in Central America through rights-based research, learning, and programming. Uh, Dr. Christine Wade uh, is a member of the faculty of Washington College and a specialist in the international and comparative politics of Latin America with a focus on Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, Jason Motlog is a journalist, photographer, and filmmaker who has reported uh, for media organizations including National Geographic, Rolling Stone, The Washington Post, The Guardian, and The Economist. Uh, and um, I will insert in the record a more extensive biography of all of you, uh, but uh, for the purposes of time, I want to get right to the testimony. So uh, why don't we begin, Mr. Saldio, um, we, uh, we welcome you here, and uh, make sure your microphone is on, make sure the green, I think red or green, I don't know what it is, but make sure it's on, um, and I um, appreciate you being here. I think it's on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of Congress, congressional staff, colleagues, on behalf of the Human Rights Institute of the Central American University of El Salvador, a Jesuit institution, I want to thank you for the invitation to speak today to you as part of this important and timely hearing on recognizing the current human rights situation in El Salvador. 2018 cannot be considered a positive year for human rights in El Salvador, even having on mind that some important statistic numbers are inferior than previous years. One of the important steps uh, that the state made this year was the sentencing of important cases against high public officials like ex-president and ex-general attorney. For first time since the peace agreements, uh, the Office of the General Attorney was able to touch interests that were historically perceived as untouchable by government, by the militaries, and by some in the private actors. Despite of this, another small achievement in the last three years by the Office of the General Attorney, the Legislative Assembly decided to change the General Attorney, electing a lawyer whom is really close to the dominant party of the Assembly in contravention of the judicial precedent that is forbidden the nomination of candidates related to any, any, to any political party. The new leg legislative assembly did not only jeopardize the office of the general attorney, but also dropped the previous agreement about the general law for water rights, passed a bill that adopted some extraordinary measures for the prison system, adding them to the ordinary law, and finally delayed the election of the new members of the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court in a clear effort to elect people that could restore the rules that favor historical impunity. All those measures adopted by the Legislative Assembly are in clear opposition 
of the general principle of progressiveness of human rights. On the other hand, the government continues mistaken subsides with social justice and relevant problems like violence, inequality, and poverty remain as strong as always. Education and health are clear evidence of present social injustice and an authentic mechanism to perpetuate the unjust inequity in the country. The judicial branch does its part, does its part systematically mistreating to the poorest one and ruling the cases without any international standard of human rights. The Committee on the International Convention on the Civil and Political Rights on their report clearly states its concern and how the state weakness institution like the Procura Procuraduría para la Defensa de los Derechos Humanos, not providing enough resources to ensure its mission of accountability for all the state agencies of human rights standards. Our institute in 2018 on its 33rd year of existence and ap active action of defense of human rights received around 370 requests of assistance for which we were only able to support only 279 cases of human rights violation, being two thirds of those cases related to humanitarian protection assistance for people that is trying to flee the country. The year 2018, also according to the Instituto de Medicina Legal from El Salvador, the country closed the year with 3,341 homicides in total, with an annual rate of 53.98 murders for each 100,000 habitants. It is true that it's a rate inferior to the ones years before, but it's clearly important to make it. Not less important is the high number of feminicide in the country, which is also one of the countries with the highest rate in the world reason why it's necessary to have a public policies and criminal justice policies with a gender perspective that can be effective on approaching those crimes as well the crimes against LGBTQ community. In addition, another hard reality is the high rate of sexual offenses that are committed in El Salvador against women with rate of 50% severe crimes of sexual nature against women per every 100,000 habitants in the country. One of the other things that have called the attention of civil society and the international community is the existence of extrajudicial killing. Actually, the special rapporteur on extrajudicial, extrajudicial summary or arbitrary execution on her report to the Human Rights Council make a this statement. The special rapporteur learned of a large number of alleged extra, extrajudicial killing on death resulting from excessive use of force by security agents. While official acknowledged there might be some cases of extrajudicial killing, they insisted that they were isolated incidents. However, finds that the above mentioned pattern of behavior by security personnel points to extrajudicial execution facilitated by an inadequate investigation at the judicial responses. The reality is that we cannot provide an exact, num exact number of how many extrajudicial killings might have happened in 2018, but according to the National Civil Police data, on 2018, the rate of people dead on the so-called illegitimate aggression was 125 people dead by one police death, a number out of any international rank for this kind of event. Uh, while it's true that the numbers of murder in the country have decreased in the last year, one of the biggest concerns is the, the number of disappearance continues to increase. According to the Office of the General Attorney, there were 3,514 complaints for missing people, the double in comparison to year 2017. And there are many that suspect that those disappearances are a way to cover some murders and even some extrajudicial killings. Example of this was the case of the agent Carla Ayala, a policewoman that was killed by other members of the police, which body was missing for a long time after the crime in a way to avoid prosecution. A recent investigation documented different cases of human rights violation from agents of security in the country, and one of the conclusions is that the continued practice of criminalizing young people, mostly between 18 and 20 years old, and from low-income community as a member of organized crimes in the country, without any reasonable, reasonable evidence to make those assumptions. This behavior produced that mistreatment, torture, cruel, unhuman, and degrading treatment are common against this population. The General Inspector Police Security reported many cases, as well as the Office of the, T Office of the General Attorney and the Procuraduría para la Defensa de los Derechos Humanos about complaint against police for committing really hard crime as murder, torture, injuries, threat, liberty, 
deprivation, robbery, arbitrary detention, extortion, feminicide, and illegal trespassing. Another important issue that we would like to make before we close is that more than two years since the Constitutional Chamber declared the unconstitutionality of the amnesty law, there is no significant progress in the fight against impunity in the country. Only the Office of the General Attorney took some step in that direction, creating a special unit to investigate those cases. But until today, the only cases that are in court are the ones that have been imposed by private actors and not by the office in charge of the work. The Legislative Assembly created an ad hoc commission to discuss what they have called national reconciliation. And so far, the only proposal they have is to create a new amnesty law in their term, extensive and general, for everyone involved in the crimes of the armed conflict against all the rules of international law that mandate that there is no possible amnesty to the crimes against humanity and war crimes. As institute, we are really deeply committed to the fight against impunity because our founders of Educa, Father uh, Montes, was one of the Jesuit killed by, by the army on 2018. And the case, after two years of being on court, was just finally reopened the last, this past Monday. Uh, after many, uh, many instances by the defense to delay the cases, but we are glad and that finally the Chamber of uh, Appealing have decided to reopen the case. That is what I would like to say by now, and I will gladly share later some recommendation that we think we should hear. Thank you very much. Mr. Bullock? Good morning, um, Congressman McGovern. Make sure your mic's on, okay. Because this is also being live streamed, so if you don't, you don't have your mic on, I can hear you, but no one else can. <laughs> Good morning, Congressman McGovern and distinguished members of the commission. On behalf of Crystal Style in Central America, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to report on progress made in advancing justice for war crimes and crimes against humanity committed during the Salvadoran Civil War and the current situation of violence and internal displacement and human rights violations in El Salvador's penitentiary system. In 2016, the Constitutional Branch of the Salvadoran Supreme Court declared the 1993 amnesty law unconstitutional. The ruling left null and void a law that froze investigation and prosecution for some of the worst atrocities perpetrated on the American continent in modern times for nearly three decades. Political will among Salvadoran authorities to promote truth, justice, and reparation for the victims has been insufficient. In July 13th of 2018, in a hearing on compliance with the court's order, the court found that the Attorney General was to be partially compliant for reopening cases of war crimes and crimes against humanity, while also failing to dedicate adequate resources and personnel to their cause. The Legislative Assembly was found to be non-compliant with the court order for failing to legislate a new national reconciliation law, and the Minister of Defense was found to be non-compliant for failure to open access to military archives, while the Executive was found to be non-compliant for failing to present a national plan for reparations for victims. The 1981 El Mazote massacre is the most advanced of the cases reop reopened subsequent to the 2016 ruling. 16 senior and junior, junior military officers have been charged with nine crimes, including mass murder, torture, and rape. The case is largely driven by efforts of the victims and their families with support and legal representation from civil society organizations. The Attorney General has neither contributed substantively to the process nor acted as an obstacle for justice. The judge overseeing the discovery phase of the trial has acted with independence and demonstrated a commitment to adhering to international standards on tradition, transitional justice and relevant inter-American and constitutional jurisprudence pertaining to the case. After hearing victims present, present uh, 38 victims present testimonial evidence and reviewing forensic evidence, the judge determined in November of 2018 that in addition to the crimes of mass homicide, rape, and terrorism, the crimes committed in the village of El Mazote in 1981 constitute a crime against humanity. Despite progress in the El Mazote case, there continues to be grave political risk to the still fragile transitional justice process underway. In July of 2018, the Legislative Assembly created an ad hoc commission to study the Constitutional Court's ruling and propose new legis legislation for national reconciliation. 
The commission recently produced a draft law proposing a new broad, absolute, and unconditional amnesty for crimes committed during the armed conflict. As you know, extreme levels of violence, impunity, and a failure to pub of public policy to protect victims persist in El Salvador today and continue to drive internal displacement as well as cross-border movements of Salvadorans fleeing that violence. According to a national survey conducted by Cristosal and the Public Opinion Institute of the University of Central America, ELO, 5.2% of Salvadorans report to have been internally displaced due to violence in 2018. 12% per reported that they or someone in their household were forced to flee the country because of violence, and 5.2% of households report to have children in their homes who were forced to abandon their studies because of violence. In 2018, the constitutional wing of the Salvadoran Supreme Court, in a landmark ruling, declared that the state's failure to protect victims of internal displacement constitutes a systematic violation of constitutional rights of all Salvadorans. The magistrates ordered the executive to formally recognize internal dis displacement by violence and the legislative assembly to reform the legal and policy framework to meet the international standards on response to internal displacement, while also prioritizing funding for programs to assist victims in the national budget. The Constitutional Court's ruling sets a historic precedent establishing the rights of internally displaced people and charts a path forward for building a policy response to the humanitarian crisis in the Northern Triangle that merits international attention and support. The failure to create programs to assist victims is one of, in one of the most violent countries in the world is a consequence of secur a security policy approach that singularly prioritizes punitive and repressive actions against the population. The underlying premise of this approach to citizen security is the false theory that in times of insecurity, it's necessary to violate the rights of some citizens to guarantee the rights of others. Consistent with this doctrine, in April of 2016, following the failed gang truce, the Salvadoran legislator adopted a series of temporary reforms to the penal code aimed at, re aimed at reestablishing control over prisons and reducing homicide and extortion perceived to be orchestrated from within the prison system. Under the extraordinary measures, 15,033 people, including both sentenced prisoners and people still awaiting trial, were kept in lockdown in their cells for two years with no pastoral or family visits or direct access to legal representation. The approximate overpopulations of the cells was over 280%. The conditions contributed to the disproportionate suffering and death of the population targeted by the extraordinary me measures relative to the rest of the prison population. In 2017, 66% of overall deaths in the prisons occurred in prisons under, under the extraordinary measures. 95% of diagnosed cases of malnutrition among prisoners in the first nine months of 2018 were in prisons under the extraordinary measures. And during that pe period of time, 15 people died of malnourishment. The lack of light and ventilation directly in the cells directly contributed to the propagation of tuberculosis in the prisons where inmates were not allowed to leave their overpopulated cells. In 2018, there were, were 1,400 cases of tuberculosis in the prison system 44% of these were in just three of the 10 prisons under the extraordinary measures. Mr. Chairman, it is the position of our organization that the foundation of peace and security in El Salvador rests on truth and justice for the atrocities of the past and a commitment to protect and assist victims of violence in the present and an absolute respect for human rights of all citizens. Thank you, and I look forward well, to Well, thank questions. you very much. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, now, Dr. Wade, I want to, uh, before you say, I want to thank you for giving me a copy of your book, Captured Peace, Elites and Peacebuilding in El Salvador. I look forward to reading it, but I appreciate it very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the commission. Uh, mic on. Yeah. 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 Oh, now it's on. There you go. <laughs> uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the Commission today to discuss the relationship between past and present impunity in El Salvador. El Salvador's 12-year civil war left an indelible legacy of violence and impunity in the country. Since the end of the war, weak institutions and rule of law, corruption, and low levels of economic development and even geography have made the country particularly vulnerable to corruption, organized crime, and epidemic violence. To understand the situation that El Salvador faces today, one must understand how the legacy of impunity has influenced attitudes about crime and corruption and corrodes respect for rule of law. 
According to the Commission on Truth for El Salvador, whose repo report from Madness to Hope was published in March 1993, the Salvadoran state engaged in criminal violence and crimes against humanity against civilians during its 12-year civil war. The Truth Commission attributed 95% of the violence and repression to state security and parastatal forces. The report documented the deliberate, systematic, and indiscriminate violence that resulted in extrajudicial killings, forced disappearances, torture, massacres, and other violations. Reports of massacres were routinely dismissed, and there were no efforts to investigate such crimes during the war. As the report noted, were it not for the children's skeletons at El Mazote, some people would still be disputing that such massacres took place. Unsurprisingly, there was resistance to the report, its findings, and recommendations by political and military elites. Just five days after the report's release, a sweeping amnesty law was passed, which prevented the prosecution of crimes committed during the war. But the 1993 amnesty law not only prevented criminal prosecutions, but the trying of civil cases and investigations regarding the status of victims during the war. By shielding perpetrators of gross human rights violations, the amnesty created a legacy of impunity that continues to undermine human rights, security, and democracy in the country. The amnesty was overturned in 2016 and a trial for the massacre at El Mozote is currently underway. But in recent weeks, a proposal for a new amnesty law has surfaced. The proposed law threatens justice and accountability and would reinforce a general culture of impunity that is the legacy of El Salvador's brutal civil war. The refusal to accept accountability for past crimes is merely one example of the culture of impunity emerging from the war. El Salvador's political elites routinely undermined reforms agreed to during the peace accords, which ultimately limited the prospects for judicial reform, stalled electoral reform, and undermined both the integrity and functioning of El Salvador's security forces. This legacy of impunity is manifested in various ways, but two of the most damaging are violence and corruption. Salvadorans experience violence in many forms, both physical and structural, in public and private spaces. Violence in post-war El Salvador is a chronic violence, meaning that it is elevated and persistent. More Salvadorans have died in the post-war era than died during the war. For nearly two decades, El Salvador has had one of the world's highest homicide rates. Its femicide rates, which refers to the deliberate killing of women because of their gender, is the third highest in the world. Few of these crimes are ever investigated, and even fewer make it to trial. Approximately 95% of homicides in El Salvador go unpunished. Moreover, successive administrations have violated the terms and spirit of the peace accords through their reliance on militarized policing, which has resulted in a number of serious abuses, including extrajudicial killings, disappearances, and arbitrary arrests and detentions. Corruption in El Salvador is endemic. It can be found at all levels of government. It infects all public institutions and none of the country's parties are immune. Some progress towards battling corruption was made under outgoing Attorney General Douglas Melendez, who brought corruption charges against three former presidents, the former Attorney General and powerful businessmen. He also pursued cases against high-ranking police officers for extrajudicial killings, as well as establishing a historic crimes unit to investigate war crimes atrocities, including the massacre at El Mozote, the assassination of Archbishop Romero, and the murders at the University of Central America. And yet with all of this, Melendez barely scratched the surface of impunity and corruption in El Salvador. It was perhaps unsurprising that Melendez's term was not renewed in December, but it is disconcerting that his chosen successor has no background in criminal law and no prosecutorial experience. There are no easy solutions in dealing with this type of endemic corruption and impunity. It will require a concerted effort by El Salvador's public servants and civil society with the assistance of the international community to address them. First, El Salvador needs significant support for meaningful institutional reform. We should support President-elect Bukele's crest for a more robust, internationally supported anti-corruption body. Judicial independence must be strengthened. The process by which the Attorney General and Supreme Court justices are selected must be made transparent, and the qualifications of those serving in the judiciary, as well as those selecting them, must meet appropriate standards. Second, 
We should support meaningful police reform and the demilitarization of public security. Violence is a serious problem in El Salvador, but militarized policing has resulted in serious human rights abuses and should not be a substitute for professionalized police force. Finally, we should support victims' demands for justice and accountability for crimes committed during the war. The newly proposed amnesty law threatens future prospects for rule of law and societal reconciliation. There can be no real peace in El Salvador that coexists alongside impunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Matlag. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Chairman, and the Commission for allowing me to be here today. Uh, I'll start by saying that I'm not a political scientist nor a social scientist. Uh, I'm not an expert on El Salvador. I'm a journalist and filmmaker who spent the last decade reporting on conflicts in failing states up close around the world. Over the past several years, a lot of my focus has been on El Salvador, whose people are being squeezed from every direction. Today, a climate of hyperviolence and impunity continues to drive legions of Salvadorans to flee the country, even as their prospects for safe passage and protection in the United States have withered. Making matters worse, the Trump administration is determined to revoke temporary protected status from some 200 Salvadorans living in the U.S., forcing them re to return or risk deportation. Last fall, I traveled around El Salvador for a month on assignment for National Geographic magazine. I wanted to survey the violence engulfing the country to examine the impact of both gang and state violence and shed light on the lives of people trapped in between. I also wanted to better understand how U.S. policies dating back to the country's 12-year civil war have stoked the climate of impunity that reigns today. <coughs> we spoke with a wide cross-section of society, security officials and illiterate farmers, gang members and their victims, academics and members of the LBGTQ community, serial killers and the brave public servants who work to unearth their crimes. Simply put, El Salvador is a state of fear, a place where gangs operate from urban centers to mountain villages like a shadow authority, intimidating, extorting, killing, where elites are largely immune from their wrath and the poor underclass lives at their mercy, where sexual violence is commonplace and women are murdered and disappeared, never to be found where even if someone rejects the gangs, a neighborhood or family affiliation can still get you killed, either by gangs or police who are shooting suspects on sight. A place, in other words, where you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And yet several times a week, U.S. immigration authorities fly plane loads of Salvadorans back to the hell they fled. I was surprised to learn that the main deportee processing center in San Salvador, the capital, a facility whose construction was partially funded by U.S. taxpayers, is situated in a gang-controlled territory. Gang graffiti greets deportees as they step outside, and some told me they were uncertain they would reach their families. I met with Israel Tikas, a forensic criminologist who works for the Attorney General's office. He's tasked with digging up mass graves and can scarcely keep up with the workload. Most of the victims he digs up are women, used, abused, and targeted in revenge killings. In 2017, 468 women were killed, or one every 19 hours. Countless others are missing. One survey found that just six out of every 100 women would even report a rape, reflecting a deep fear of gangs and a near total loss of faith in the rule of law. Several of the gang members I interviewed admitted to committing dozens of murders and dismemberments with the casual affect of young men who have known nothing but violence since childhood. For some, the only way out of gang life is finding God in prison, where an evangelical revival is taking place. But that's no guarantee of safety back on the street. Families described how their children and grandchildren are being shot by militarized police squads, part of a rise in extrajudicial judicial killings and abuses that echoes of 1980s era brutality. They refuse to pursue accountability for fear of reprisals from authorities. Instead, they're sending their other children to the U.S. We must not, of course, forget that the violence we see now is part of a continuum that goes back to the Civil War even before. In the remote village of El Mazote, I spoke with farmers who lost family members in the 1981 massacre by government forces armed and trained by the United States. More than 1,000 villagers were systematically murdered, mostly children. All these years later, relatives are still waiting for justice. 
It's no secret that during the war we supported El Salvador's right-wing regime with billions in military and economic aid, prolonging a conflict that killed more than 75,000 people and uprooted more than one million. We've defended the government, despite overwhelming evidence the military and allied death squads were killing with impunity. In the aftermath of the war, we began deporting thousands of Salvadoran criminals back to a state that could not contain them. Many of these men were refugees who carried the traumas of war and displacement with them back to a broken homeland. The story of one former gang member I spoke with illustrates the entire cycle. After seeing relatives murdered by authorities at the start of the Civil War, he fled to Los Angeles with his mother. He joined a street gang for solidarity, went to prison, and was deported back to El Salvador. In a vacuum of law and economic prospects, his worst instincts flourished. Since then, the gangs have become violent beyond belief, expanding into what he calls a social monster. Today, that monster is tearing El Salvador apart. It's vital that we protect Sal Salvadorians who have found refuge in the United States and make every effort to support the rule of law, accountability, and justice in the country as we bear some responsibility for their plight. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you all. Thank you very much for your excellent testimony. And, um, and I have to tell you, um, I think this is an important hearing because I think we need, to, we, need to, we need to get Congress and our government to focus more on the realities of what's happening in El Salvador. Uh, you know, so much of our policy is just focused on our border, um, and we're not even getting into why people are fleeing places like El Salvador. Uh, it's just all about controlling our border. It's, it's immigration and, and drugs, uh, and there's almost no discussion here about human rights or about uh, you know, our failed past policies uh, in, El in El Salvador. Mr. Saldia mentioned Segundo Montes, Father Segundo Montes. I, you know, my first visit to El Salvador was in 1983, I think. Um, and, um, and I remember meeting with Segundo Montes then, along with Father Ayu Correa, uh, both of who were assassinated in 1989. But I think I want the record to reflect that we would not have TPS today, Temporary Protected Status, if it wasn't for Segundo Montes. I worked for Joe Oakley, the congressman who actually um, wrote the statute, uh, but Segundo Montes came up here repeatedly to testify uh, on the realities in El Salvador and giving us the statistics of why people, who was leaving and why they were leaving. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, I just want, I want that to, to be clear. My last, uh, well, I've been there, my last visit was in, in um, uh, last August. Uh, and before that, I was there um, a year ago, November. Uh, Mr. Bullock was kind enough to help arrange a visit uh, for our delegation that the Washington Office on Latin America sponsored to um, El Mazote. And uh, I brought my then 16-year-old daughter with me. Um, you know, um, and I think she was, uh, you know, struck by the. The, the, the site of the list of the people who were murdered um, in El Mazote uh, and their ages, because almost most of them were 16 years old or younger. Uh, and I think it was hard for her to comprehend that anybody could commit such a crime against children. Uh, and um, I mean, some of the ages were zero because they were infants or they were you know, fetuses. And, um, and it just is it was such a horrific crime. And we look back, uh, it was a crime that the United States at the time denied even happened. Um, and uh, there's one person in the current administration who I remember denying that it happened. And, um, and it still unnerves me that, uh, you know, that uh, he wasn't held to account for, you know, for that uh, misinformation. Um, but it's... Fr it is frustrating because I think our policy during the 1980s was misguided. I mean, it was not, human rights never played in, in a factor. I remember being, going to New York during the peace accords and believing like, this is like incredible, right? We're gonna end the war and then everything will be great. Um, and, um, and, and I was wrong. Uh, the war came to an end, peace accords were signed. Unfortunately, an amnesty was passed um, and, uh, and everybody kind of walked away from El Salvador, including the United States. All the billions that you 
talk about going to El Salvador in the 1980s, you know, get diminished in incredibly um, during the peace. I mean, we, we were there for war, but we didn't want to be there for whatever reason for peace. Um, and, uh, and as a result, El Salvador really never rebuilt. Um, we never demanded uh, that, uh, or never assisted in a meaningful way in uh, dealing with the issue of impunity. Uh, we didn't complain when amnesties were passed that covered up and t you know, turned a blind eye to some of the worst atrocities uh, imaginable. Uh, and, you know, and here we are today, I mean, with a, with a situation where th this is an incredibly violent and troubled country. You know, when I visited El Salvador in the 1980s when the, when the war was going on, um, I, I, did, I, I didn't feel the insecurity that I feel now when I walk through neighborhoods alone. Um, and, you know, and that's telling in and of itself. And we've had various presidents and administrations from the right and from the left, and everybody talks the talk, but nobody wants to walk the walk. Nothing really changes. Um, you know, I, I was happy to be part of an effort to support Pro Buscada, um, which basically is aimed at trying to help families whose loved ones were disappeared during the war find their bones. Uh, and um, I remember we did, we did a, a, a meeting at the UCA, and I, I it was a, like a little town hall meeting, I guess you'd call it. I didn't expect that many people to come, but the auditorium was filled. And it was filled not only with older people, you know, um, who remember who were there during the war, but I, I, I what was struck me most were, were were young people who weren't even born uh, during the war, who were born after the war, holding up pictures of their distant relatives. It could have been a grandfather or, or an uncle or whatever. And and I, I think what struck me was the fact that, you know, it is clear that you know unless you get to the truth, unless you, unless there's some effort to find out what happened, you know, those, those tragedies never go away. They get passed on from one generation to another, to another, to another, another. So, you know, people who say we don't, we want another amnesty, or we don't want to find the truth in El Mazote, or we don't want to, you know, find out what happened in the Jesuits, or hold a, anybody accountable in the Jesuits case, or, or a, a, a thousand other terrible crimes in El Salvador, those who think that if we could just brush it aside that it'll all go away are wrong. It doesn't go away. It just festers. Um, and it also decreases any confidence that the government is legitimate or is, is meaningful or, or, or really cares about justice or human rights. So, you know, I, you know, as we've had this big debate about, you know, children are being separated from their parents at their border, which in my opinion is a human rights crime in and of itself. Um, and if it were happening in any other country, we'd be demanding an international investigation. But I, I, I think we need to re-engage on what is happening in these countries, and in particular, El Salvador. What is the reality that is happening on the ground? And, uh, and we have to deal with it, and we have to understand that we have a responsibility here because we created a lot of this, the unrest and a lot of the turmoil and a lot of the impunity, quite frankly, uh, because during the war, in particular, uh, including with the murder of the Jesuits, our government was only too willing to turn a blind eye. Um, you know, so we have a moral obligation, and if we want to do something about immigration, we have an other obligation to try to help El Salvador rebuild and deal with the issue of impunity and deal with the issue of, of uh, you know, of a lack of professional security force, if you will. Uh, in order to be able to, to, to move forward. Now, I mean, we, have a, we just had an election in El Salvador, um, and we have President-elect Bukele, uh, and, um, you know, and I, I met him, I, I read about him, I don't know a lot about him, um, but I guess my question to all of you is, you know, what is the most important message Congress can send to President-elect Bukele on human rights, corruption, and accountability. And let me just add one other thing here. I mean, I, you know, when I met with him briefly, I thought that he was sympathetic 
to the idea of maybe a kind of a SIG type of, you know, uh, presence in El Salvador to help, you know, deal with the issue of corruption. And now I'm, I'm getting signals that maybe he's moving away from that. Um, and I, I'm just, I'd like you to kind of give me, give us some guidance on, you know, what are the messages we should be sending to him, and, you know, and whether or not you think, you know, a, a SIG type of uh, presence in, in El Salvador, you know, is not only appropriate but necessary given what we given where we are today. And I open it up to anyone who wants to go first. Mr. Bullock. It's a big question that you're asking. Um, President-elect Bukele uh, doesn't necessarily have a political party in the assembly that it would allow him uh, to make, uh, through his own political party, major changes in a policy or legislative framework, but he has significant communicational power. Uh, he can move uh, the electorate and he can move public opinion. Uh, and I think we should encourage him to move public opinion in favor of combating corruption, uh, but also uh, m strong messaging from the executive that tolerance of human rights violations in pursuit of citizen security uh, will no longer be the norm. Uh, I think that we need to have strong messaging uh, to make sure that the internal, co internal controls and in the police uh, and in the armed forces are in place so that when crimes are committed, uh, there can be investigation and justice. And these are messages that are sent back to the citizens that open up a series of other options to re-control territory uh, and reduce violence, like community policing. There's something that's going on in El Salvador where uh, we have progress uh, alongside violation. In the same prisons where some populations are being tortured, there are good programs like Yo Cambio for rehabilitation of prisoners. Those need to be highlighted. Uh, in the communities, there are community police, but then there are police operations in which uh, violation and abuse are perpetrated. Uh, the other thing that will be important is that uh, President-elect Bukele makes a priority on assisting victims. Uh, assisting victims will restore uh, trust among the citizenry to engage in criminal justice processes, to cooperate with the police, uh, and is an important step to combating impunity. You, even impunity uh, in terms of financial corruption, people that they don't believe that the justice system will work for them, they don't activate it. Uh, there's an under-registration of crime because people fundamentally don't report it. So strong messaging on those uh, lines, I think, would help to improve the human rights situation in the country. Dr. Wade. The creation of the CCS uh, was the cornerstone of Bukele's election campaign. Um, so I think he can't afford to turn away from a robust anti-corruption effort now. The question is exactly what will that look like, right? Is a CSIG type model appropriate for El Salvador or is there something um, that can be domestically owned that is more appropriate? I think we have some very able public servants in El Salvador um, and some with a great technical expertise who perhaps have some ideas about these things. I think that we should be lending our support. We should be signaling that we're willing to support um, any type of effort to combat this. I think one of, you know, people thought, well, Melinda's made decent enough progress. Maybe we should just support it through the attorney general's office. Things seem to be working. Melinda's really barely scratched the right. surface of corruption and impunity in El Salvador. And, and what the country really needs is, is a body that can investigate and make recommendations for broad systemic change within the country. And I think, you know, Attorney General Melendez, who I met with many times, but certainly compared to his predecessors, I thought was a welcome, uh, you know, uh, addition, uh, you know, who I didn't feel was going out of his way to frustrate um, investigations and in some cases was very, very helpful. Uh, but Mr. Saldia? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the first thing is that uh, the President-elect needs to recognize all the efforts and the baby steps that the current administration have done. There are some really good public policies that we have all supported as a social uh, civil society as the El Plan El Salvador Seguro. Uh, that was this uh, public policy that was aimed to uh, reduce violence and crime in the country 
uh, sadly, the government reported that it wasn't implemented in the way that was meant it to be. But it, that is, for example, a really good idea of things that need to continue in the time and not change it just because it's a change of administration. And there are some other baby steps that have happened in the past years that we think that they should like continue to go. Uh, everything in the way that um, the fight against impunity will uh, strengthen the state's agencies and will recuper and will help us to, to the citizens of the country to recuperate um, the trust in the institutions because what we have today is that most of the citizens of the country do not trust the institution, do not trust the system in any of the aspect, uh, and we can re see that as a reflection of many other issues. Uh, the only way to build peace in the country is really a strengthening the uh, agencies that are, are working with security, with justice, uh, with historical memory. In about CCS, uh, we support it in, in a way that first we, need re we, we really need to know what he's thinking. We haven't really have any draft about what his idea is really about, but we consider that uh, any effort to fight impunity must be considered uh, not only the corruption and, and serious violation of human rights happening today, but also uh, it, it, it has to ha address the historical impunity happening in the country with the things of the armed conflict. Uh, we also believe that it's, the idea should be um, autonomous right. agency that could support the uh, attorney's general office, uh, but not replace them, and, and, and find a way to work together. Uh, the Guatemalan experience was a nice experience that maybe could be uh, replicated in El Salvador, uh, adapting to the reality right. of El Salvador as well. Um, but uh, we also believe that uh, it doesn't matter how it's created, it shouldn't be directed under the presidency, right. and should be worked aside as an autonomous agency next to the general attorney's office. Mr. Mollock, you've done, you know, you've, I'm sure you've talked to lots and lots of young Salvadorans and when you were, during your, in your work and average Salvadorans who are not connected with the government or are not connected to the security forces. And I mean, I mean, do you get the sense that they have trust in the institutions that exist? Do you believe that they think their future is gonna get better? Or do you, I mean, I mean, what is, what is, what's the, what's the sentiment that, uh, that you have, uh, found when you talk to average Salvadorans in very, El Salvador? Very bleak and cynical, I think is the, the, the shortest way to put it. Um, you know, these two, the two-party system has had a, a death grip on politics in the country for so long, and the consensus was that it's, it's just gotten so self-serving and stale and that the government is not looking out for the interests of the people. I, I you know, what was on the upside, you know, having worked there for several years, I, I, I felt a nascent sense of optimism um, that Bukele does represent uh, something of a change and that there seems to be a meaningful window that he can take advantage within the country right. to build some good faith and which the United States can support, I think, be, by being proactive on supporting civil society organizations and accountability within the government. Um, on the street level, I think there's still a lot of doubt and concern, and rightfully so, because the inf insecurity is, is stifling and that stretches from urban centers into you know, more remote pockets of the country. Um, I would advocate, you know, it's something that can immediately be done is, is improving, uh, supporting protective services inside the country, um, especially for women. Um, you see so many women and children fleeing, it's because they have zero, zero faith in what the government can do. There are very rigid policies they have even for shelters where there are time limits to the, the amount of time they can spend um, and there's just not a lot of care and concern for, for their, their welfare. And so I think finding ways to invest and support um, those kinds of agencies um, for people who can't leave the country. Right. So here's my, for what it's worth, my view is that you, you do need a somewhat of an independent um, force to come in. I think much like Mr. Saldia has suggested, uh, you know, and to, uh, to, to do a kind of a sig like uh, operation in um, El Salvador because for years we have heard people on both sides, well, all parties, say they want to deal with corruption and they don't. Um, and you know, and I think that unless there is pressure or an independent force, you know, obviously working in conjunction with the with the government, uh, but not un necessarily under the auspices of the president, I'm just afraid it's, the, it's we're, we're going to have the same old, same old. 
Um, I mean, look, the reason why SASIG is a problem in Guatemala right now is because it's effective. Um, and, the, and, and the people who are involved in corruption are, are very, very close to the top. And so, you know, they don't want to, they don't like that idea. But I, I just think we, we're at a point now where, I mean, something dramatically different has to happen. Otherwise, it's going to be a continuation of the same, same thing. You know, I, I, um, I remember back when the Jesuits were murdered and we would, I was working for Congressman Oakley, we were doing, we were tasked with doing an investigation into who did the killings. And I remember meeting this Salvadoran who assisted us um, in the investigation, a guy named Lino Gomez, um, who's a very interesting figure. But I remember Joe Oakley asking him at the time, what, what is this war all about? You know, what, what, what is the reason? What, what's the root cause of all the problems? And he said one word, corruption. Um, I mean, it's people who are basically corrupt and who want to protect uh, what they have. Uh, and, uh, and as time has gone on, I, I've come to believe that, that, that uh, he was right. Mr. Bullock, you are focused on the El Mazote case, which is something we care very, uh, and let me, before I get to that, let me just also say too, I think the United States government um, ought to be more vocal on this issue of um, uh, corruption and impunity. Um, I know we have a, a new, um, we're about, should, soon to have a new ambassador. I don't know a lot about him, um, but um, from what I've read of his testimony and what I've heard about his testimony before the Senate, I don't think he talked about what you guys just talked about. And it seems to me that this is what we should be talking about. Um, you know, I, don't, I didn't hear him talk about a SASIG type of uh, operation in El Salvador to deal with impunity and corruption. I didn't hear you know, about, you know, the issues, uh, you know, the, the, the human rights issues. Um, you know, I, and I think that, that I'm, I, I don't know, we're going to meet with them at some point, but I want to give them the benefit of the doubt right now. But it, it just seems to me that if, if any of us were testifying to become ambassador to El Salvador, I think uh, our testimony would reflect a lot of what all of you were saying here today. Um, and uh, so it is a little bit troubling that, uh, that that, that uh, you know that that wasn't in his in his written testimony, uh, but Mr. Bullock, you are you're focused on the El Mazote case, one of the worst atrocities um, that has occurred uh, in Latin America ever, and um, and um, and it's been a struggle. Um, uh, it's been a struggle getting the government to cooperate. Uh, and by that I mean, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, inf key information that the Minister of Defense has on the, uh, th they may have on the, on, on the, on the incident, uh, which military forces committed, uh, they have not been forthcoming to the judge or the Attorney General, am, am I correct on that? Yeah, that's one of the uh, unfortunate legacies that Sanchez Seren will leave behind when he leaves office is he, uh, as the commander in chief, didn't give a direct order to the Minister of Defense to open the archives for the victims. Uh, and, and am I correct that technically the president of the country has, since he, he controls the armed forces as well, has that ability to be able to f force them to uh, turn over any information they have? He has the ability as well as the obligation uh, uh, given to him by the Salvadoran Supreme Court ruling. Uh, one of the issues that will also be important to President Bukele uh, is his commitment to rule of law and separation of powers. And that will mean complying with Supreme Court rulings even from the previous court. So our expectation would be that President, when he becomes President, Bukele will make a, issue a direct order to the Salvadoran Armed Forces, to the Minister of Defense, to comply. And if he doesn't, then we know we're in trouble. Is that accurate? That, that would be his obligation uh, under right. the ruling of the court. And another recommendation that would be useful for President-elect Bukele would be in the naming of his cabinet. He could also mark uh, a new precedent in the country naming uh, true civilians to uh, the position of Minister of Defense. Uh, and p profiles that will be alternative to the traditional profile of a police mm -hmm. officer in the position of the Minister of Justice and Security. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always been a disbalance between uh, 
the presidency, the executive, and the military, and that still exists uh, in the current dynamic. And, um, but I think it's, it's accurate to say that this will be a test, right? I mean, so if there was no direct order, if there's no ask, uh, then that would be a cause for concern. Let me also just say that, I, I, you know, we've had this conversation before. I mean, the United States was intimately involved uh, in the war <laughs> uh, in El Salvador during the 1980s. Um, we, correct me if I'm wrong, are responsible for kind of the, I, I, out of the training of the Atlacot Battalion. Um, and, um, and we kept records. I mean, we know names, we know, we know a lot. I, you know, I, I can't believe during that time that I don't think anybody can believe that we totally just turned a blind eye to everything and knew nothing that was going on. Um, we also believe it's really important that the that um, that the that any information that has not been de declassified, and I'm assuming that the declassified information has been very helpful um, in your in, in building the case on El Mazote, but then any information that has that may be you know, in our intelligence agencies, which has not been made known, that that information would be helpful. Um, and, it, and the United States government should make any, every effort to be working with those who are trying to get justice in that case. Yeah. Declassified documents from the Department of Defense and the Secretary of State have been key for prosecution of war crimes across Latin America. And the same is true in the El Mosote case as well as other cases of transitional justice in El Salvador. But beyond that, I also think the United States has an obligation to the victims of the crimes uh, and to open and de declassify existing information about crimes committed during the war is an act of reparation to the victims. And I think, Mr. Saldia, I think that, you know, um, um, your institute, I think, could also play a role in, I mean, not only in helping to de demand the U.S be forthcoming in the uh, area of the El Mazote case, but a whole range of other cases as well. Yeah, we totally support that. It is necessary the, uh, to disclassify some documents that are contain really strong historical perspective. What we have recently done is to request to the United Nations office and, and the headquarters of New York, at least to be able to give us access uh, to the documents of the Commission of Truth that as you know, when the peace agreements were signed and the Commission of Truth was written, uh, it was under a secrecy that it has been protected all this year, but we believe that it contains vital information about many of the cases that we are willing, that we're trying to f seek justice today. But it is also true that, uh, that not only the militaries in El Salvador, but also the State Department and the Defense Department of the US must have or might have some important information that really could help us to seek and, and, and find justice in cases like the Jesuits one. And let me just say to everybody on, on this panel who I know is interested in getting the truth of these cases, I mean, we, look, we wanna work with you uh, to, make, to, to help fashion requests to the relevant uh, agencies and departments in the U.S. government to be more forthcoming. Uh, and not only in terms of written requests, but you know, as we debate things like the defense authorization bill and other bills that are relevant and germane to these issues that maybe to insert language in, the, in that bill to compel uh, the administration uh, to be more forthcoming. I mean, these events, many of these events happened many, many years ago. Uh, it's hard to make the case that there's, you know, national, it's a national security threat to uh, reveal the truth, uh, but it is essential, um, you know, for you know, these families, uh, of the victims and the victims who are still alive. Um, you know, one of the things that I've realized every time I go to El Salvador uh, is that a lot of the people that I first met with uh, in the early 1980s, many of them, by the way, were killed during the war. Uh, but now many of them are just, you know, are, 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 are dying because they're getting older. <laughs> um, you know, and, and so, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the firsthand accounts uh, you know, are, are harder to obtain. Um, and so the longer we wait, the more difficult, the, the difficult it's gonna be. Let me, let me ask a question here. You know, are, are there concerns for the safety? I mean, we talked about the safety of a lot of the, you know, people fleeing El Salvador, but in terms of this issue of impunity and dealing with justice, I mean, the, the safety for the judges and the prosecutors, uh, 
you know, who act with independence. I mean, are we, um, are we, are we doing, I, I know that, you know, I, I mean, I've talked to many of them um, who I know are nervous. I mean, do, do, we, do you feel that the United States is doing all that we need to do to provide them protection so they can operate with independence? Salvia? We need to figure out first or put it over the table that the last general attorney was under uh, protection measures from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. So that it shows you a little bit about the reality, like those that had been willing to and had done some efforts in the fight against impunity and corruption uh, in the country still need uh, security. I believe that uh, putting that uh, over the table and realizing that if the general attorney that was uh, in function until a few months ago was under this special protection, maybe s some other people might need it as well. Bullock? Up to this point in the trial uh, of Omosote, there haven't been major security concerns, but I think that that shouldn't be an assumption that we carry forward. Right. Uh, the international spotlight that the United States can shine on the trial and on the key actors in the trial and others it will be really important. Um, I want to, if you, if I could just share a story uh, of a village, uh, one of the villages that was part of the massacre is called Cerro Pando. Uh, the massacre of Omosote was concentrated in the village of Mosote, but affected also surrounding hamlets. Uh, and then December 11th uh, of last year, uh, which is also the anniversary of the El Mosote killing, one of the leaders of the Victims Association uh, in the village of El, uh, Cerro Pando was executed in his home uh, in front of his son. Uh, since that time, uh, four other people, a total of five people, have been murdered in a small hamlet outside of El Mosote uh, and Crystal South's legal staff have checked in on the situation. Uh, there have been no significant investigations by the Attorney General open about the murders. The police have not offered protection uh, to any of the, uh, the villagers or the victims. And when we speak with the victims about their willingness to come forward and collaborate uh, in, a, in uh, litigation or in the investigation process themselves, they are too afraid. We don't believe the murders are linked directly to the, the trial, but the effect uh, and the terror that they have on the population is the same. So while transitional justice uh, in this second opportunity doesn't carry the risk of returning to the same wars being conducted in, a vi uh, in an environment of generalized violence, uh, and uh, one statement to by a ten -year -old, the 10-year-old boy who witnessed the murder of his father to our lawyer uh, is telling. Uh, we asked if he would be willing to uh, provide information to the investigators and he said I'd rather just wait and take care of it myself later on. Mm. You know, we talked about uh, after the war there was an amnesty law then the amnesty law was overturned and now we're talking about a, a potential another amnesty law uh, in El Salvador that the National Assembly may take up which will protect you know if it passed all the people that we're trying to bring to justice and we want the truth about, I mean, wh what is the, uh, I mean, what's the, what, in your view, what, what's the likelihood of that passing? What can be done to prevent it from occurring? You know, how is the debate over a new amnesty law affected by the effort to pass such a law in Guatemala? I mean, what, what, what is, is this something that people who care about human rights should be concerned about, or uh, did anyone have a assessment of, of how real this is, or? <laughs> Jim, I, I've, I've been surprised, uh, Congressman McGovern, I've been surprised about the reaction of the, uh, against the, the amnesty law. Uh, I think that it would be wildly unpopular uh, in public opinion and among the electorate in El Salvador. And I think increasingly people link the abuse of power that permitted uh, these grave atrocities in the 1980s with the abuse of power uh, that permits corruption. And that was the issue that brought President-elect Bukele to, to victory in the recent elections. And so I think uh, while the right-wing party and even the FMLN could easily make a coalition within the assembly to pass a new law of this nature, uh, they would pay severe consequences with the electorate. 
also uh, it's important to note the statement made by the Department of State in Guatemala against the amnesty law in Guatemala. A similar statement in El Salvador would go a long way to reaffirming the expectation of the international <coughs> community uh, that the ruling of the court be upheld <coughs> and that justice and truth for these crimes be uh, a responsibility held by the authorities. Has, uh, and I, I may have missed it, has, has, our, has the U.S. government issued any statement on potentially, uh, uh, you know, uh, on, on the potential of a, of a new amnesty law? Or there was a declassified cable uh, from the ambassador to uh, the State Department here in Washington that was uh, published in, in the press in El Salvador, uh, in which the ambassador is clearly supportive of investigation and prosecution for the El Mosote crime. But again, that's an unclassified document in an informal uh, statement. Uh, a formal statement as, a po as an official policy position is still needed. Um. What explains the very high level of femicides in El Salvador? Um, because that's been a, a very, uh, I mean, everyone's going to raise that issue. I mean, why, in your view, are women and girls the targets of such violence? Um, have, have U.S. efforts to address the violence in El Salvador been sufficiently gender sensitive? Uh, and, you know, what should we be doing more on this issue? Dr. Wade? I think that the level of gender violence is broadly reflected of societal norms in El Salvador. Um, and I don't think that despite the creation of things like women's cities, for right. example, I don't think that there's been a concerted or serious effort um, to address gender violence at its roots. Um, in many ways, when we talk about insecurity in El Salvador, um, we think of these things, we, we treat the, the symptoms rather than the disease. And I think that in this case, this is about, you know, shift in societal norms that could be signaled more strongly through government policy that's adequately funded um, and adequately supported. Um, women experience violence, um, both public and private, at epidemic levels um, in El Salvador. And we talk a lot about femicides today, but um, also um, adolescent maternity is a very serious problem in El Salvador. One in three girls um, becomes pregnant in El Salvador. Um, and again, this is sort of broadly reflected of societal norms about women as property. Um, for men, I think. This is part of the same phenomenon that Jason was talking about um, of women within gang territory, where women within gang territory are property. But I think this is reflective of a broader societal problem about the role of women <coughs> in society and generalized gender norms within the country. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's elusive, but I think that, that's, that hits at the, one of the main roots of it. Um, I think the devaluing of women uh, over time, and that has been aggravated by um, lack of economic prospects for young men, um, the climate of violence you know, that forces you from a very young age to be reactive and to strike back to meet violence with more violence. Suddenly you're inured to the effects it has on others and to yourself. And I think at its root it's about power. You know, Often this is, these are disempowered young men who resort to acts of dramatic violence as a means of asserting themselves in a situation that largely feels beyond their control mm -hmm. and which the impetus is to act first before you are a victim. And I think women are by and large a casualty of that. They are treated as property. They are targeted as a way of getting back at rivals and their families and they're, they're caught up in the, in the fray. I think I just wanna say because I think that probably the violence against women in El Salvador that's committed by gang members is perhaps some of the most more dramatic right. or, or certainly more obvious. I mean, uh, Jason talks about digging up mass graves and women who have been dismembered and so forth and so on. But I think it's important to remember that the majority of women who are impacted by violence, it happens within their own homes. Right. It happens within their workplaces. It happens in the street. It happens with people that they know. Gang violence is a part of sort of the broader machista um, elements of violence within El Salvador, but women are violated um, in all spaces in the country. I just may add too, yeah. the, the first time I actually went to Salvador, El Salvador was to report on uh, women's lack of reproductive mm. right, rights. Yeah. So it's the state as well. The state right. is, yeah. is, is effectively sanctioning this. Um, very conservative country, you know, where elites can afford to have abortions, use birth control, 
on their own terms and the poor are held to account. Uh, and so what that yields is, is women who are you know, doing backstreet abortions, uh, sometimes dying, bleeding, rather than um, right. going to authorities. There are cases where women have been taken to the hospital uh, having bad miscarriages only to wake up handcuffed to the hospital bed and to, to spend you know, 10, 15 years in prison. I mean, this is what the state itself mm -hmm. is doing. So that really, I think, sets the tone. Um, you know, the women are, are dealing with this on all sides. Yeah. Just to add to what I already said, that uh, it's a lack of uh, policies with gender perspective. Uh, the country's lack of policies, public policies with gender perspective. And we have not only the, femini the feminine side rate is high, but also the sexual assault and also sexual related uh, crimes against especially teenagers women are really high, are one of the highest in the world as well. Um, and, and, and you have all this uh, status structure that oppress uh, women's right, and as the colleague already said, let us just remind <laughs> the case of Imelda, this woman that was held in prison for mostly two years for uh, allegedly abortion, that after the two years she was absolved of all the charges. But as her, there are so many other girls that are still in prison uh, waiting for a trial, <clears throat> and the lack of uh, gender perspective even in the criminal policies, because we have prosecutor prosecuting uh, young women that have had uh, a spontaneous medical miscarriage and they are prosecuting them not only by the abortion crime which is in the criminal law in El Salvador but they are prosecuting them for murder and aggravated murder so it takes them for more than 15 years so it, it's a mix of many factors that we really need to look at and, 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 and try to see how we can support to change those policies as well. Um, we get another maybe Eight minutes here before we have to lose the room here, but let me let me let me try to get a, few, a couple other issues in here too. The issue of the internally displaced uh, uh, Salvadorans. I mean, the last couple of trips I've been there, uh, raised the issue to the government. It doesn't want to talk about the internally displaced population, but it's a huge and growing number of people uh, in El Salvador. Um, you know, uh, you know. Uh, I mean, what what are the prospects for all of these many many internally displaced people being able to return? to their homes, um, you know, what are the obstacles uh, to improve strategy? Uh, has it, it, I, don't, it, I don't think it's been high enough on the international agenda, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big problem, it's a growing problem. Um, you know, what international support would be useful on this issue? Um, and I know protection's a big part of it, uh, but it, it, it seems that the protection efforts are, at least my assessment based on what I, you know, are, are, are not comprehensive. Um, and um, there are a lot of people who need protection who aren't getting it. Um, it's important to note that uh, after the Supreme Court ruling uh, last year, in July of last year, there has been some change on the policy uh, and official position of Salvadoran government in relation to internal displacement. Uh, the state officially recognizes now displacement vis-a-vis -vis the ruling. Uh, uh, members of the executive branch who don't officially recognize displacement do so in contradiction to the obligations they have under the court. Uh, Crystal Sal, uh, with support from uh, victims groups as well as other civil society organizations, we've presented a special law on internal displacement that would create an institutional framework to respond to internal displacement uh, and help assist victims in finding solutions. One of the things that we're doing is to try and uh, develop models for effective response. Uh, their response can be challenging and there's very little experience in the country uh, in reality beyond sort of temporary safe houses about how to help people resolve the issues that drive them from their homes. Uh, we believe that a good uh, approach to this would be integrating protection into territorial development plans to be able to work at the local level with communities and municipalities to be able to uh, accompany families to reintegrate within the country uh, and to be able to restore some of the exercise of the rights that they lost uh, as a consequence of their internal What, what are the number internally displaced? What's the est guesstimate right now? I mentioned in my testimony that uh, in the national survey that we did with the, with the UCA that 5.2 percent of the population uh, reports to have been internally displaced by violence. If we extrapolate that number, it's about 230,000 people uh, 
new displacements annually. Annually. Annually, which is a, a very high number. Right. So over the last three years, we're talking about 700 and 600,000 to 700,000 people. It's also important to note the new numbers that I presented, too. Uh, when you talk about 12% uh, of households saying that someone fled the country because of violence, uh, when we look at the numbers of people repatriated who are unable to return to their homes or home communities because of violence, and you look at numbers of school desertions, these are all proxies to right. be able to indicate the magnitude of humanitarian need in the region. Uh, what can be done by the international community? We need to strengthen protection systems uh, within the region uh, to encourage governments in the region to create alternative pathways and alternative uh, protection options, uh, as well as strengthening protection systems within the region or within the countries of origin. Let me, uh, let me give you uh, each one of you an opportunity to fill in what I didn't ask, um, which you think is important for the record. Um, so I, I um, Mr. Saldia, do you want to? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We would only would like to add that uh, in, in, in sentences, we, we strongly believe that uh, a better El Salvador is possible, that peace can be built in El Salvador. But to achieve peace, we need to take serious steps in fighting uh, the general impunity and corruption in the country because these two factors are the ones that really have deteriorated the institution of the country. So every effort that we can take in fighting a general impunity and corruption in the country will really help you out for people to trust against the institution and try to do their best to work. Uh, we believe that also migration and for displacement sadly is something that is not going to stop soon because the condition have not really changed in the last time. So every effort that you can take and your office can take to support uh, people fleeing El Salvador would be also really helpful. Uh, we also believe that uh, we need to put in the center of the discussion again the victims. Uh, sometimes we keep saying this discussion in high levels, but there's human beings that are suffering the consequences of violence. Uh, there's human beings that are going to die without seeking, without, be, without being able to see justice and, and recuperate their historical memory. Uh, the Educa have done a really nice experience for the last 11 year of having a restorative justice trial every year for victims of the armed conflict, uh, of the conflict uh, that it's willing to recognize the truth and for them has been quite important just to someone to tell them that they are not lying, that what it happens to them really happened. And, and, and we should also support all the measures that strength and support uh, historical memory for the country. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving us the opportunity to participate in this. I think I'll close sharing the story uh, of a community outside on the outskirts of San Salvador uh, in which a 14-year-old boy was recently killed in a police operation. Uh, the boy uh, had developmental disabilities uh, and was frightened by the police operation in which the young men of the village were being uh, rounded up and he ran. Uh, he was detained by the police according to accounts of members of the community uh, and put on his knees and shot in the head. Uh, since that time, the police have left writing on the walls of the community saying that if you speak, uh, we know who you are uh, and we'll kill you all. Uh, in our work with the community try to try and incentivize them uh, to activate justice for the crime, uh, a comment from one of the matriarchs of the community stuck with me. Uh, she said, we love that boy, he was our neighbor. We love that family and we want things to get better in the country, but we don't want to die uh, and they'll kill us all. So I wanted to highlight that uh, because I think it's important that the, to remember it's not an intractable situation. There are decisions that can be made uh, and there's will the people to continually to improve the country. Even on the issue of uh, torture within the prisons of gang members where it seems uh, to be popular to say we should just kill them all, we don't care. Uh, the same custodians uh, who are part of that policy <coughs> have said to us that we don't think that uh, violating the rights of people has been effective and we need to bet on something else. And I think that's what we have to highlight as we talk, uh, the United States talks to El Salvador uh, and as we look at our own political situation in the country. Human rights are not an added extra, they're a key strategy for security and peace. I think that when you're looking at a country that's faced with a level of overwhelming violence that El Salvador is faced with, all you can see is the violence. 
all you can see are the gangs, all you can see are organized crime syndicates or transportistas or whatever. But I suggest to you that this type of violence is a symptom of something that's much greater. And I think that heretofore we have primarily, the United States policy has focused on the violence, stop the violence. It's important to stop the violence, but you can't stop the violence without treating the root causes of violence. And this is one area where our policy has been severely lacking. Um, we need to support institutions. This is, my students know that this is a big thing of mine and this is the least sexy thing of all in political science, I think, but institutions, institutions, institutions. Institutions matter, right? We need rule of law, we need institutions at work, we need to develop citizen confidence that institutions are capable of protecting them. We need institutions to serve people rather than to prey upon people. And I think that technical support growing assistance for the development of institutions is where we should be focusing our efforts rather on the continuation of policies that have not only served to increase violence in the country, but increase human rights abuses as well. So, Mark Lag? Yeah, we, we started talking about uh, the plague of corruption and the weakness of institutions. Um, I really think, you know, we, we corruption is, is a, is a symptom uh, of impunity, and we've seen impunity in, in many different degrees, many shades. I think we need to acknowledge the ghost in the room and, and go back to some of the original sins that have not been uh, have not been looked at and and, and uh, resolved, and exploring historical memory um, around uh, crimes committed El Mazote and in other places. I think there is a window now where we can um, use our leverage as a, as a country and supporter of El Salvador to back those processes, to empower transitional justice. But also I think it's time to, to kind of lead by example a little bit. And I think part of that will mean reckoning in earnest uh, with our role uh, in the atrocities that happened and the fallout of that. And perhaps that can mean taking some, some real initi initiative and that can be a prelude to um, some kind of amend, uh, making amends uh, in the future. So I think that's kind of where we have to start, and that's where, you know, as a as an ally, um, we can really uh, lead by example. You know, and I and I look at I I appreciate uh, everybody's testimony here today. I do think we need to focus on institutions um, as well, um, you know, and um, and I think um, we have to break the back, of, help El Salvador break the back of impunity. Because um, ultimately, Salvadorans are going to control what El Salvador is going to be. Uh, but right now, the deck, is, the deck is stacked against average Salvadorans uh, because impunity is still such a big problem. Corruption is still such a big problem. And, you know, and I will say indifference by the international community is a huge problem. I mean, I don't even know what the hell U.S. policy is toward El Salvador. I mean, I, if someone gave me a quiz, I don't, I, I don't know. I, it was an essay. I don't even know what to write because um, I really don't know what it is. Um, and it's not just this administration. I will say it, it's been a bipartisan problem for a while. Um, and the deal is is that uh, we help contribute to the chaos and to the brutality and to the killing uh, and to the impunity uh, during the war. Um, and we have, and we, uh, in my opinion, all but abandoned El Salvador in the aftermath. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I think, you know, if we, you know, if, if we're, we want to live up to our own values, I think we do have an obligation to help support institutions and individuals who have the courage, you know, to demand that human rights be front and center, uh, that, uh, and that accountability be there as well. You know, I, you know, the, uh, that's why we're w watching this El Mazote case so closely. I mean, this is a big deal, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a, hu a huge human rights atrocity. Um, and there's lots of international attention uh, on this case. And, you know, um, and there's, you know, lots of people watching uh, what's happening in that case. If you can't get justice in that case, you know, with all the support, uh, with all the attention, then you're not going to get justice in the case of that young boy that you talked about who was murdered in that village and that nobody wants to speak up for. Um, you know, the problem is good people don't want to speak up because they don't think it matters or they think it will end up with them being killed or their families being killed. And, um, 
And that's why this whole debate on immigration uh, is, and migration uh, at our border is so frustrating because if Congress spent a little bit more time trying to understand what is happening in countries, not just like El Salvador, but in Honduras as well, and Guatemala and others, I think, you know, there would be more of a willingness to, I mean, to provide the resources because some of this is, go is going to cost money um, and to be part of the solution. And I just, again, I go back, you know, we, I don't want to, I don't want to trash our ambassador to be, um, but I hope uh, that, uh, w that what will be coming out of the administration will be more responding to the issues that you raised here today. Uh, than just talking about drugs and immigration. I mean, it's, it's more complicated than that. And uh, I'll just close with this. I mentioned my first visit was in 1983. I think it was a, that was when it was. Um, and I've gotten to, um, and, and you know, I, I got to know countless people uh, from that time to now, uh, some of whom are my dearest friends in the world, some of who perished uh, in violence. Um, some who have died from natural causes. Uh, but I have always been bothered by the fact that uh, some of the greatest people I've ever met are in El Salvador, you know, um, and yet these people have suffered so much. Um, and, and much of that suffering could have been prevented uh, by us. And uh, so uh, in any event, uh, I appreciate you being here and this hearing comes to a close. Thank you.